Hey guys, welcome to today's episode and we have Dr. Anthony Chafee. He's actually a neurosurgeon and he's also a functional medicine doctor. So today we are going to be talking all things health and welcome Dr. Anthony. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So I want to hear a little bit about your diet and what a kind of a typical day looks like for you and why you have chosen to eat the way that you do. Well, for me, I, I follow a strict meat and water diet. Only some people call it a carnivore diet. It's really just an ancestral approach. Like we, we mentioned the paleo diet. That really is what paleolithic man ate, especially during the ice ages going back about 2 million years. Humans have been apex predators for about 2 million years. That's what the best evidence shows. And apex predators, by definition, are carnivores, and you'll eat meat uh, when it, when they have meat available. We've had a survival advantage because we can survive on different plant foods better than, say, lions or wolves can, but we still do best on meat, and our ancestors would generally go after the meat. And we had a very high trophic level, which means that we were top of the food chain. Um, so that's, that's sort of the principles behind why I eat that way. What I eat during the day is just meat. So I will just typically eat red meat. I eat a lot of steaks. Um, 99% of what I eat is, is probably beef and steaks from beef. Sometimes I'll have some eggs. Sometimes I'll have some pork bellies or eggs and, um, and that's it. So I'll have other sorts of meats as well, but I want things to be high fat. Fat is actually very important. For us into our health. It's not just a calorie source. It's a, a full complement of essential nutrients. And so it's very important to get enough of that. The reason I came to this is because when I was taking classes in my undergraduate degree, I was taking classes in botany and biology and then cancer biology. And we were learning that plants have different mechanisms of defense. Most of them were chemical in nature. And so the plant kingdom makes about a million different defense chemicals and they can be very harmful for you. I mean, this is why if you get lost in the wood, you can't run, and you can't just eat any random plant if you run out of food, because most of them will make you very, very sick or even kill kill you. This is why most plants are termed inedible plants. Now, there's some plants that, that are edible to us, but that doesn't mean that they don't have toxins. Those plants will kill other animals. Grapes, for instance, will make dogs and cats very sick. And if they have enough of them, they could die. And we think of grapes as just a, a very normal, healthy fruit, even. Um, but they do have toxins in them. It's just we have the ability to detoxify them and work them out of our system a little bit better than dogs and cats would say. But that doesn't mean that they're not toxic. And grasses that a cow eats have toxins in them, but the cow can detoxify those specific chemicals because they have adapted to those specific chemicals, just like a koala can do the same with eucalyptus. So this is true throughout the animal kingdom. If your species hasn't evolved to eat a specific plant, then you won't have the requisite defenses to protect yourself from the toxins in that plant. And so this was brought home to me. And this is something I learned in botany. This is something I learned in biology going back all the way through to junior high school, that plants and animals are an evolutionary arms race. Plants becoming more and more toxic, so less and less animals can eat them so they can survive and thrive. And then animals becoming more adapted to the specific poisons in the specific plants that they eat so that they can eat that plant and survive. And that's their dedicated food resource. This was really hammered home to me when I was taking cancer biology at the University of Washington in Seattle, when our professor was showing us all the different toxins that were in plants and showing us that they were carcinogenic in nature, at least these ones were. And at the time, there, the Brussels sprouts were described to us as having 136 known carcinogens in them and that mushrooms had over 100, and then spinach and kale and salad and celery and cabbage and cucumber and all the different things that we'd see in the produce aisle all had dozens, if not over 100, carcinogens in them. They were quite abundant. We had to know from the work of Professor Bruce Ames from the 1980s and into the 1990s that the naturally occurring toxins that he knew about, and he knew about far less back in, in the late 80s, early 90s than we knew about later and now, that just those that he knew about were 10,000 times more abundant by weight than the pesticides we would spray on them. And that in animal models, they were hundreds of times more likely to cause cancer than say mushrooms, just the normal mushrooms that we would eat. And so his conclusion was, well, since we all know that fruits and vegetables are good, and since fruits and vegetables are so much more 
chock full of toxins and pesticides naturally than the pesticides we spray on them. We shouldn't ban any of these pesticides because obviously they can't be that bad. That was the argument. They were trying to ban these pesticides because they thought they were getting people sick. And they probably were. But that was the argument because people assumed that fruits and vegetables were good for you and safe for you. And they were so much worse than the pesticides. So obviously the pesticides must be good for you or at least not bad for you and at least not horrible for you. So we were taken aback by this, very taken aback. And I remember being very shocked by this, thinking he must be joking, but he wasn't. And I remember thinking in my head, well, but vegetables are still good for you though, right? And he just gave us a funny look and he said, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. I said, okay, I'm done eating plants. And so I went to the grocery store and I just was trying to find something to eat that didn't contain a plant, but the entire grocery store was full of these things. Processed food, unprocessed food, produce aisle, clearly all of these things were made out of fruits or vegetables or combinations. And so I came across some eggs and I said, okay, eggs don't come from a plant, I'll eat eggs. And Meat, meat doesn't come from a plant, I'll eat meat. And that's what I ate for five years in my early 20s. From 20 to 25, I just ate meat and eggs the entire time. And I was in college and I was um, in you know, pre-med, got my degree in molecular and cellular biology. And I was playing rugby professionally. I was playing in the university team. I was playing in the premiership team in Seattle. And we, we played in the, all the top leagues in North America. I was an All-American. I traveled throughout Europe and New Zealand and South Africa playing rugby. And I absolutely felt like a superhero. I'd never felt any better in my entire life than that period of time when I was when I was only eating meat. And and this changed when I was in England playing professionally. And I, I sort of slipped off the diet and I, I sort of convinced myself that maybe a little bit of plants weren't that big of a deal. Same argument that I'm getting from from people now that say, well, dose makes the poison, so it's probably not that big of a deal. I said that to myself. I, I, it was just sort of a bit more convenient to buy chicken that was already prepared and cooked like chicken drumsticks. And some of the times they had breading like panko breadcrumbs on it. And I was looking at it, well, it comes from plants. It comes from grains. I shouldn't do it, but it's not that much. Is it that big of a deal? Dose makes the poison. Maybe it's not that, that much of a problem. But the problem is that the dose is actually quite small as it turns out. And I did not feel nearly as good. I started getting aches and pains and injuries. I wasn't as, as energetic. I wasn't as explosive. I got worn down before. I couldn't get tired. I couldn't run out of energy. I couldn't wear myself out. I could just, I was the hardest worker and I could just go, 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 go. And now I, I started having limits, which was very strange because three months ago I had no limits. Uh, and so it was very strange. I, I sort of remember thinking to myself, why don't I feel as superhuman amazing as I normally do? Am I just not pushing myself as hard? Am I not um, you know, training as much? Am I just, I'm 25 now. Is that just it? Everyone says you hit your late twenties and it's just downhill from there. Am I just dying now? I didn't know what it was. I figured I just chalked it up to age. I guess I just hit that point where I just had to work a lot harder and, uh, and not get as much for it. But that's what it was. It, it's I, looking back now, that was the line. And because I started letting something slip through the door, a few other things and a few other things and a few other things. And I was basically back to eating what I ate as, a, as a, growing up, which was always whole foods, very meat heavy because that was my preference. And I'd have a salad because I was forced to, or I, I felt I was supposed to, or something like that. And I might have some bread, almost never had pasta, but you know, it's just some sort of thing. Sometimes I never ate junk food and I just sort of lived as everyone else did. I, I had to work a lot harder to stay in shape. Anytime I was in the off season, I would put on weight and I would lose muscle. Whereas before I never did that. Um, I didn't feel as good, didn't have as much energy. When I worked really hard, I could get back in shape. And I kept playing rugby into my into my late 30s, you know, last sort of full season. At that point, we'd been up when I was 35. And then I was doing humanitarian work in Bangladesh and I was helping with my parents who were having health issues. And when I got back from Bangladesh um, in 2018, early 2018, I came across information that said, no, wait, we really are just carnivores as a species. That's what we've been eating biologically uh, for millions of years. And that's what we're supposed to eat. You know, you have signs at the zoo that say, don't feed the animals because it makes them very sick if they don't eat their natural diet. Well, 
we're not eating our natural diet and I'm not eating my natural diet, but I was then. In that period of time that I've never felt better in my entire life, I was eating what our ancestors would have eaten, largely meat, really exclusively meat. And that was when I felt better than I ever had in my life. I said, right, I knew it. I knew plants were trying to kill me, get rid of these stupid things, and I just cut them out. And I just start, went back to eating just meat, and I felt absolutely amazing. I, I was 38 years old, and I lost 23 pounds in 10 days, and then I just started shredding fat and stacking on muscle. And after two weeks, I felt so good, I said, right, I'm going back to play rugby. And I went back and started playing professional rugby again at 38. I hadn't played a full season in three years, and I felt amazing. And it was like I was 22 again. It was just a dead sprint the whole time. I could push myself uh, to no end. And it was just, it was, I just felt incredible. And I started getting better and better and better. And because I realized what I was doing now, I realized how impactful that was on my health. I really started digging into it. And I started looking at this from a, the lens of a doctor saying that, okay, we're humans and we're carnivores, but we're not living as carnivores. We're not eating as carnivores. And like those animals in the zoo, we could be getting sick from that. And then things in medicine really started clicking into place. We have all these called idiopathic uh, diseases like diabetes, and autoimmune diseases, all these sorts of things. Idiopathic, you know, meaning you know, an idiot that can't figure out what's going on. It means we have no idea what is causing this, and so we just put up our hands and just say, "Well, let's let's figure out a pill that sort of slows this down." Now I figured that out. We're eating the wrong thing, and we're and we're seeing the manifestation of that. We know this in veterinary medicine. They they're actually much more clued in than we are. Um, because uh, livestock is expensive, it costs money. And so you, as a vet, you need to figure out what's wrong and you need to fix it. Whereas people, you die, just, well, that's just the way it is. So they figured some of these things out. And there, there are a whole, there's a whole field of live, livestock, livestock medicine where we have all these diseases like big head, limp neck, big tongue, crazy cow syndrome. All these refer to diseases that are known to be caused from eating the wrong plant. They start eating a plant that they wouldn't normally because they're stuck in a pasture and they, they don't have enough forage or feed and they get very sick. Or things that are, are nutritional deficiencies in nature, like muscular dystrophies. Muscular dystrophy. Cows actually get muscular dystrophy. It's extremely similar to the muscular dystrophy that humans get. But while we say this is idiopathic, Someone has a genetic condition that just gets it, even though it's not 100% penetrance. If you have the, the, the sort of genetic factors, you won't necessarily get it. Cows get this too, but they figured out this was actually from a selenium deficiency, which is a micronutrient that we need as well. And that just begs the question, has anyone looked into nutritional deficiencies for people with uh, muscular dystrophy? I don't know if they have. I certainly haven't seen anything in the literature. So that started making sense to me why we're getting sick in the way that we are. And I started digging into literature and trying to figure out what we knew and what we could prove. And I actually started uncovering quite a lot more than I than I thought I would. But it was it became quite clear to me that the so-called chronic diseases that we're treating these days as a mainstay of the medical profession, nearly 93% of the issues that doctors treat on a daily basis are these non-communicable chronic diseases. That these are not diseases per se. But, well, let's let's talk about autoimmune disease because sure. you know, autoimmune it really encompasses almost 80 different types of chronic diseases where the immune system attacks the body, including celiac, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, you know, just all of these kind of they, there's like 80 different ones. So but but what it really boils down to is that most of these have almost the same symptoms like extreme joint pain, fatigue, digestive issues, skin issues, you know, they all kind of have some of those same issues. And there's a lot of people who are saying that if like Kim Kardashian has psoriasis, which is an autoimmune disease, uh, tennis legend Venus Williams has Sjogren's uh, syndrome, which also um, is an autoimmune disease. And they basically are saying that they follow a plant, mostly plant-based diet to help with the autoimmune. And I think that what happens is, is that everyone can agree like, you know, artificial trans fat, like margarine and, you know, seed oils and deep fried foods and alcohol and sugary things like chocolate and pastries and donuts, right? Like all of that 
causes massive, massive inflammation. Where the contradictory comes in is that there's two different camps. One, probably like three actually, um, from all the guests that I've had, you know, we've had over 500 episodes with the biggest and best doctors out there, Dr. Mercola, um, Daniel Pompa. I mean, we've had every guest known to man on this show. And there's kind of three different camps. One camp is to eat a grain-free paleo diet, eat fruits, vegetables, lean meats, and you'll be able to get rid of that joint pain, kind of, you know, the no pain, no grain kind of idea. Then there's the other guests that we've had that are just like, no, you need to be on a vegan diet, um, just eating plant-based. And then there's kind of your camp, which is the carnivore diet. We've also had Paul Saladino on the show several times talking about an animal-based diet, which is more of meat and fruit because the fruit doesn't have as much toxins, right? And so those are kind of the different camps of where different people are in. And so I just want you to kind of talk about, okay, what is your thoughts on, you know, the like a animal-based diet? Because one of the big, my biggest problem with the carnivore diet to me is two, I have two objections to it. Number one, I just don't feel like it's sustainable. Like I just feel like at some point um, I can just get to my snapping point and just be like, if I eat one more piece of meat, I'm like, I just am going to completely snap. And (laughs) um, number two is I personally have major, major issues with constipation. And I believe that the the carnivore diet, because it doesn't have the fiber in it, um, you know, can give you more of a constipation issue. And to me, the number one thing that you have to do no matter what is you have to be moving your bowels. Because if you're not moving your bowels, you are keeping those toxins in your body. And the other thing about a carnivore diet is it requires the body to break down glycogen stores in the muscles and liver. And then that basically expels, you know, that glycogen can have the body expel through the urine, which then can lead to dehydration. And that lack of water is not good for forming stools. So for me, the constipation issue is my number one biggest hang up and I go okay do you do you not agree that having healthy healthy bowel movements is absolutely imperative and two I don't I don't know anyone who's on a carnivore diet that would say I have the best bowel movements ever like I would say that they would say you know in that transition, I definitely w- would struggle with constipation a little bit. So now I'll let you address all of those issues. So yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of take those in part. So, you know, so yeah. starting with the with the autoimmune side of things, you know, the the commonality between all of the, the different methods that you described there is that they're eliminating something. They're getting rid of processed foods and seed oils and sugars and all these other sorts of things. So you're cutting out a lot of different things that your body can react to. We don't know exactly what's causing autoimmunity, but the the going theories are some sort of molecular mimicry. You you have an insult to your body, either a bacteria or an infection or a to- toxin gets in your body and your body reacts to it as a foreign invader and makes antibodies towards it. Then the thought is, is that you would then, through what's called molecular mimicry, these, these antibodies are just similar enough, they're close enough to latch onto your own body that they do, and now you sensitize to that now your body starts attacking that. But that's not actually what we see in practice because when you remove these different food items, you actually see, you can actually measure these antibodies and they go down. So what's almost certainly happening instead is that you're making antibodies towards some sort of internal invader, be it pathogen or some sort of you know, uh, organic toxin or inorganic toxin, and you're getting cross-reaction and that that's damaging your body, but you stop eating those things and those will go down. Or another uh, 
theory that's been put forward by Dr. Natasha Cam Campbell McBride, who's a neurosurgeon, one of the top neurosurgeons in the world. She came up with the GAPS diet and she's healed a lot of people with autoimmunity. What she says is actually these plant toxins like lectins that actually bind on, they can bind onto the surface car carbohydrates on your cells. This is actually what causes leaky gut, is what lets them in your body in the first place. Things like wheat germ and glutenin, gluten, that this attacks parts, it attaches the parts of your gut, attacks them and rips apart those tight junctions that normally keep out things that we don't want as barrier protection. That's sort of like skin on the inside of your of your intestine keeps these things out. Now you have little cuts in the skin, things can get in, uh, microscopic. So things get, get in that way. And now these lectins are in your body, these bi bacteria are in your body. Your body's attacking these things because they're not supposed to be there. Um, but they can also latch on to cells in your body, like your thyroid, like your colon, like all these other sorts of parts of your body. And then your body can can make antibodies towards that complex. So it's attacking the lectins or or the different sorts of toxins that are attaching to your body. And there there is a strong association with lectins. And there actually has been a lot of research that has shown a connection between lectins getting in the body and autoimmunity. And so your body attacks that complex and you actually get specific antibodies towards that. Like you, you'd be able to test for specific antibodies for Hashimoto's disease, for instance. And so that makes more sense to me that that's what's happening. You have this toxin organ complex that the body is now atta attacking. Same thing though. You just stop eating those things. They stop being in your body and you stop making antibodies. It's that simple. And so whatever you do, you just want to eliminate things out that your body could be attacking. And so if you go on a clean whole food vegan diet, then, and you improve the, well, that's great. I'm really happy for you. You're eliminating out things that your body's reacting to more. But I cannot tell you the amount of patients that I have that were whole food vegans because of their autoimmunity. And it just got worse and worse and worse. Or maybe it got better for a time, but it didn't go away. And they got sick from other reasons. And actually coming to a carnivore diet, completely eliminating plants, that actually fixed their autoimmunity. I have never seen anyone with any autoimmune condition that has not responded extraordinarily well to a pure meat and water diet. And that's in the literature going back to the 1800s with Dr. J.H. Salisbury, who was putting people with rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and other autoimmune issues on a pure red meat and water diet. And we're reversing this. This was 100 years before we had any effective pharmacological treatment and management for these diseases. And that continued through the 1900s up until there was a book written by Dr. Walter Volklin, who was a gastroenterologist who wrote a book called The Stone Age Diet and said, look, humans are carnivores. Here's the evidence for that. And all of these diseases that I treat, they don't exist if you don't eat plants. And then the McGovern report came out and, uh, and the USDA started declaring that the uh, cholesterol caused heart disease and saturated fat caused, uh, increased cholesterol and was bad for you. And we just threw out a hundred years of medical literature and just said, meat's bad, fat's bad, let's all eat plants. And the chronic disease rate, the autoimmunity rate, the heart disease rate, the cancer rate have all increased exponentially. These things have, have gone way out of control and they're increasing decade after decade. So we have this in the literature as well. There are elimination diets that you can do uh, with Crohn's disease, this has been studied quite extensively. So if you go on an elemental diet, which is only the macros and micros that you need, nothing else, it's actually very processed. It's a, it's a scoop form sort of protein drink, um, but it's uh, generally no, zero carbohydrate. These, these are ketogenic because these are generally, these were originally developed for uh, people with epilepsy. And uh, we have a hundred years of research showing that, that ketogenic diets are really effective for treating people with epilepsy. And before we had pharmacological management, that is how we treated epilepsy and migraines and diabetes. And so when you eat this, uh, this elemental shake, that is a better treatment for an acute flare-up of Crohn's than prednisone, than steroids, which is the gold standard. It has a ton of side effects, but it will su completely suppress your immune system, which is also an unwanted effect as well, because you can get infections and other sorts of problems, cancers down the road if you're immune suppressed for long periods of time. So just not eating certain things is a better treatment than steroids, right? So that should tell you this cause and effect relationship. Oh, we don't know what's causing it. Something's causing it, obviously, and that shows a cause and effect relationship. You eliminate out certain things that you eat, the problem goes away. You reintroduce those things, the problem comes back. That's a cause and effect relationship. There was another study where they removed 
carbohydrates and fiber from people's diets with Crohn's disease, and they were able to keep them in remission without medications for up to 51 months. So there was obviously, and then and contrast this with the people that didn't eliminate carbs and fiber, they stayed in remission on average zero months without medication. So it was a massive difference. And so what does that mean? That means there's something in the carbohydrates, something in the fiber, something that comes along with them that is causing this disease. You take it away, it goes away. You bring it back, it comes back. There's cause and effect. So I think that any elimination diet, when you're removing out certain things, now you can be on a vegan diet and eat. Oreo cookies and and shoot heroin. I mean, both of those things are plant based, right? So <laughs> they have to to structure these things right. But if you if you do it right and you're and you're cleaning things up and you're cutting out things that that are more bad actors, the seed oils, the uh, the sugars, the processed food, you you should get better. You should absolutely get better. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not still introducing things that can harm you. And I I cannot tell you the vast majority of people that follow me on YouTube and Instagram, and I sort of have about 500,000 people between the two platforms, the vast majority of them were former vegans and vegetarians who whose health suffered to such an extent that they had to switch to something else, and they came to a meat-only diet and completely fixed their health. So, you know, this is something that I just see again and again and again, uh, and I see it in my patient population. Uh, every single patient that is able to adopt a carnivore diet, especially a red meat and water diet, they all improve their autoimmunity. And I can, I can measure this. I have over 100 patients with Hashimoto's disease. Every single one improves on a, on a carnivore diet, every one. And I can track their antibodies. They come right down. And if they stick with it, those antibodies will become undetectable. Their thyroid will cover. Most of them will come, well, they'll all come down on medication. Most of them can come off medication. Hashimoto's takes a bit longer. It can take over a year to fully resolve because the, the thyroid really needs time to heal. Sometimes it's permanently damaged and they will need to be on a small dose of, of uh, thyroid medication long term, but everyone improves if they're able to keep it up. Did you guys know that 97% of Americans are deficient in at least one mineral? It's true. You need more than a dozen minerals for your body to function in its best, but with the standard American diet, it's almost impossible. So here's where B Minerals comes in. Guess what? All you have to do, take one little shot of this one, one little shot of this one, and guess what? It looks like this, but it tastes like water. Take one shot, and boom, in 30 seconds a day, you're getting an entire thing of minerals instead of an entire cabinet of supplement bottles. So with Beam Minerals, we make mineral balance simple. Um, so I want I want you to talk about the uh, real quick the plant toxicity scale. So you know we have this thing where we have the carnivore diet and then we have the animal based diet. And the animal based diet, you know, focuses on primarily meat and organs, but then they also allow things like fruit, honey, raw dairy, and they kind of take plants in different toxicities. So like, for example, there's certain plants like apples, oranges, berries, melons, bananas, pineapples, mangoes, and dates. Um, and then like some fruit that are not sweet, but like cucumbers, zucchini, squash, pumpkin, and avocado. And they say, okay, these are on the low toxicity scale. And then there's some other things like um, you can add a little bit of white rice or some fermented vegetables or olive oil and avocado oil kind of thing. And basically the idea is, is that some parts of the plant are more toxic than, than other, because when a plant is faced with danger, um, animals can run and fight, but plants can't, right? Mm -hmm. So they have that defense mechanism and over time, the that they have different varying degrees of of defense mechanism um and so it's on the some on the leaves and the stems and the roots because they want to protect themselves from being eaten and so because of that certain fruits like for example a banana has that thick you know barrier so when you're eating the inside the whole idea is you know it, it you're not having that 
or um, you know, some of the other things like oranges, right? Like an orange has a really big covering over it. So when you're eating the inside, it's not as toxic. So I want you to just kind of talk about that a little bit more about the plant toxicity scale and what is your opinion of adding? Because like for me, I know I, I can't, I don't think I can live on just meat all day long, every day. Like it's just, it's not reasonable. And I just know that I personally can't do it. So it's kind of like meet us in the middle. You know what I mean? And like, like, let's like, okay, I get it. You're saying like best case scenario or if, you know, maybe do, like you said, if you are in bad, bad shape and your joints are so bad and all of this, you might just have to do strict carnivore for a little bit. But what is your opinion on the animal based and some of the plants, the parts of the plants being more toxic and kind of explain that? Well, look, that's certainly true. And and there are certain parts of the plant that the plant defends much more than others. So, so take seeds, for example, and that would include grains, beans, legumes, nuts, all these sorts of things. That's just, that's the plant's baby. Everything protects the baby, their babies more than anything. And, and a seed or a nut or a legume is a plant's baby. So that's generally where you'll find the highest concentration of toxins, so, such as cyanide. There's cyanide in almonds. People don't realize that. There actually is an upper limit on the amount of cyanide you are, it's safe to eat in a day before you get a buildup of problems and you can get neurological dysfunction, thyroid toxicity, and goiters and other sorts of problems. Th cyanide directly attacks your mitochondria, breaks up the electron transport chain, so you cannot cannot generate energy in uh, in the form of ATP in your cells and you, you die from this. Um, so that's a problem. Because uh, you know, the, the, there's actually a large body of the world, about 750 million people in the tropics, rely on things like cassava as their number one source of uh, uh, calories in a day, and cassava is very high in in uh, cyanide. But this is in almonds as well, and we don't realize this. We have cassava chips that go around. The veggie chips here in Australia, they're made out of cassava, and with tapioca powder, which is from cassava, it has cyanide in it. There is a limit that WHO posts this, if I'm not misremembering, 10 milligrams a day, which is not that much. And there's no there's no sign on the packet of almonds that says, hey, you can only have this many almonds before you, you've just sort of maxed out your, your day of cyanide, which is which is a bit irresponsible, I think. I mean, if, if the WHO has actually said, hey, this is the upper limit on how much you should have in a day, that should be on the damn label, but it's not, right? Uh, because no one would ever buy almonds again if, if they said that, right? So there definitely is a hierarchy of different parts of the plants so that are going to be more toxic. The leaves, the plant does not want you to eat the leaves. When insects starts chewing on the leaves or deer starts chewing on leaves, they start sending signals. They actually, they actually send, propagate chemical signals to the other plants around them. They can actually scream. They send off chemical signals and high pitch vibration frequencies to other plants. And they say, hey, this is eating us. And they can actually tell uh, by the bite of these animals what animal or insect are eating them, and they start upregulating toxins towards that that animal or insect, which is why sometimes you'll see leaves sort of half eaten, and then they stop because all of a sudden they start. Oh, this is getting too hot, and then they, they go away. They go around to another plant. So that is definitely in the case. Fruit is something that that plants want something to eat, but that's the thing. It's not necessarily everything. They don't necessarily want everything to eat. A lot of fruits co-evolved with birds and other animals. And, and that's what they're designed for. A lot of these seeds from berries or fruits will only germinate if they go through the digestive tract of certain animals, such as birds. So the cassowary bird, for example, they eat 150 different varieties of fruit. Every single one of those fruit will kill you. Every single one of those fruit will kill everything else on earth except a cassowary bird, because that fruit will only, the seed will only germinate in the gut of a cassowary bird. And so if the cassowary bird leaves an area, those plants die out. And so it has to be very attractive to a cassowary bird and very, very harmful and detrimental to anything else trying to eat it. And that's most fruit on earth. So if you go through the woods to, to have that scenario again, and you run out of food and you see just random bulbs and berries, if you don't recognize those, do not eat them because they're most likely toxic. And so most berries are toxic. Most fruit are still toxic. There are some that we can handle things that are that are sweeter that have fructose seem to be much less toxic for humans so those sorts of those sorts of fruit 
do seem to have less toxins, but they don't have no toxins. Again, grapes will kill a cat. There's a lot of fructose in there. So they have toxins. It's just the toxins, we're better able to manage them if there's fructose in there. There are things called foranocoumarins that are in all citrus and in parsnips and in celery, something called celery dermatitis. This is something that, that's actually in the medical literature and dermatology, that if you get these foranocoumarins on your skin or you eat these things, you can become very light sensitive, very sensitive to UV light. And so the, it's in the literature. People can look this up or just media reports of uh, people squeezing limes out in the sun into their you know lemonade or making lem- you know, whatever. And, and the sun hits it at all the lime juice on their hand on their arms, and they get chemical burns. You can actually get second-degree burns um, from these these uh, these dracumarins causing chemical burns on your skin in the sun. So it's not that they have no toxins, it's just they have less toxins. And I, tr- I certainly agree with that. And so if you're going to eat some of these things, then some of these fruits that we eat, probably your best bet, say avocado. Avocado, less offensive than a lot of other things. It's not as sweet, doesn't have the sugar in it, but it, people do seem to handle it. But it does have toxins in it, like oxalates. Oxalates are sort of a hot topic item at the moment because a lot of people have problems with it. Liam uh, Liam Hemsworth, who uh, you know, the, the, you know, of the Hemsworth uh, Hemsworth brothers of actors, uh, he actually put himself in the hospital with um, uh, oxalate poisoning, acute oxalate poisoning, because he was drinking spinach smoothies every morning for three weeks, and spinach is very high in oxalates. And so he had to go in for emergency surgery because he had massive kidney stones, calcium oxalate stones. 75% of kidney stones are calcium oxalate stones coming from eating these oxalates. So avocados have a lot of oxalates in it. One thing you have to realize too, if you're going to eat fruit, it should be seasonal, local, and you should pick it ripe. You know, this is if we were eating this stuff historically, and, and certainly people would have in certain times and certain eras, during an ice age, there's no fruit available. In the Arctic Circle with the Inuit, there's no fruit available at any time of the year, whether they wanted them or not. So we know we don't need them. We just, if we want them sometimes, sure. But if you pick it green, it'll have more toxins. The seed's not ready yet. So it's still protecting that seed. The fruit has seeds in it. And this is something that, that Dr. Saladino talks about as well, is that that, that that seed's not ready yet. It'll have a higher burden of toxicity and it needs to ripen on the tree because it's, it's the plant that actually pulls out the toxins. You pick that thing green, all those toxins stay in there. They don't just degrade. And so there's actually studies with this in, in tomatoes, that if you pick tomatoes green, they, they won't degrade the solanines and the other toxins. There. So tomatoes are, are in the nightshade family. It's actually quite a, a toxic family of plants, like belladonna, tobacco, these sorts of things, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, peppers. These are all nightshades. And so... If you pick these things green, they're going to have a much higher burden of toxicity and good luck getting a fruit that was not picked green because you, you can't, these things are being picked in Honduras and then they're being shipped over, you know, two continents away and, uh, and they just won't travel. They won't travel if they're, if they're picked right, they'll just, they'll just squash. But if you make it, in, if you have it in your garden and you pick it right, it's, it's a better but the way that people traditionally ate fruit, they, they still didn't just eat them whole and just said, yeah, this is fine. The original way that the Mesoamericans ate tomatoes and the Europeans picked this up from this, and this is the traditional way of making uh, you know, uh, uh, tomato sauce in Europe, was you wait for it to, to vine ripen, then you remove the skin, you remove the seeds. Those are the areas, again, the seeds, higher le- le- um, levels of toxins, and the skin is barrier protection. And that's where things are trying to eat in and burrow in. It has to have more toxins there. They say, well, there's all the, all the nutrients, and all the vitamins. This is why we pe- peel potatoes. This is why we've been peeling potatoes for hundreds of years. That's exactly why. And then people say, well, that's where all the vitamins are. We leave, the, leave the skins on. Well, there may be more vitamins there, but that's also where the toxins are. And so when you do that with tomatoes, you take away the skin, you take away the seeds, you use the pulp, and it's vine ripened. It's less toxic. We have been eating plants for about 10,000 years. And we figured out ways of detoxifying them more, lowering down the toxic load like fermentation and um, niche tonalization. That's a, that's a technique also used by the Mesoamericans for processing corn, maize. And that lowers the toxic burden, but it also raises the bioavailability of certain nutrients. And Europeans took corn and they grew that and they took the corn, but they didn't take the technique to, to raise its nutritional load and lower its toxic load. 
And there was actually major problems. There, there was massive um, health issues called pellagra. People were dying of pellagra uh, in droves. They couldn't figure out what it was. They thought it was an infectious disease, some sort of plague. It turns out it was a niacin deficiency because so many people were eating corn and they weren't getting enough niacin. It was just because the there actually is a lot of niacin in corn, but it's just locked up. It's not bioavailable, which is a lot of new. That's another way that plants defend themselves is all these nutrients and vitamins and minerals that are in there. They're locked up in ways that we can't break down, but you can ferment them and you can put them through other sort of things like nistomalization. So nistomalization, you soak this corn in lye and that and that releases the, the niacin and lowers the toxic load in a lot of ways. So in fact, when the Mesoamericans were eating this and they were using that process, where the more tamales come from is nistomalization, that technique. And so when they were eating in that way, they, they were actually okay. That was, that was, it was an okay addition to their diet. But when Europeans were doing this and they didn't have the technique, then they would get harmed. So you have to sort of think about these things. Also, when things are damaged, then something's trying to eat that, something's bruised. This is this is sort of folk wisdom. My mom told me this when I was a kid. You have a piece of celery or something like that. Oh, it has a blemish on it. You don't eat that. You don't want to eat that. That's bad. Well, why is it bad? Is it is it you know, bacteria? Is there an infection? Oh, no, no, it's just bad. You don't want that. Well, what it is, is that something's damaged that and the plant is going to defend itself. So it's going to make more toxins. And so it's actually more toxic. So if you have a blemish or you have a bruise or you have a uh, something damaged to that, or you see an area of infest, like insects eating into it, that piece of fruit or vegetable is going to have a higher toxic load. So yes, you can eat some of these things. I would just remind people that most fruit and berries are still toxic and there's they will still kill you. Um, you know, grapes have tannins in them. Your wine has a lot of tannins and all these other sorts of things in it. That's a defense chemical. There's also an anti-nutrient. It binds to proteins and other nutrients so that we can't absorb them properly. And so that can cause harm as well. So it's just to understand that, that yes, it's, it's less. And I totally agree. If someone isn't able to just do what I do and only eat meat, and that's not acceptable for them, they don't think that they can do it. You know, there's absolutely a, a gradation here. Like if you if you're just cutting out a lot of the process, I mean, if we all just cut out processed food, that the world would be a better place. But if you're cutting out a lot of this stuff, you're going to improve. And the more you cut out, the more you'll improve. And so that's my argument. Just like you said, I think that's the baseline. I think that's as, as good as we can get is eating very high quality, very high, high you know, nutrient dense meat. And, so, and, but if you can't quite do that, as long as you're just cutting things down towards that and not being afraid of the meat and not being afraid of the fat, you will absolutely improve your health dramatically. Guys, I just want to interrupt for just a second and I want you to hear Paul Saladino talk about why liver is so important. And if you don't like liver, we have another option for you. Your ancestors were eating liver. And the reason that this sort of wisdom has been passed down is because liver is very nutritious. It's basically nature's multivitamin. If you look at the nutrients in meat, they're great. You've got zinc, you got B6, you got B12, you got some K2. But if you look at liver, it really complements what's in muscle meat. And there are many unique nutrients found in organs, specifically liver as a powerhouse of these, that are difficult to obtain outside of liver. Like meat and organs are like peanut butter and jelly. They just go together. They're supposed to be eaten together. The easiest way to eat liver is just to do it raw. If you don't want to eat liver raw, you can cook it. But the reason that I like to do it raw is because there are unique nutrients in liver that are probably somewhat degraded when you cook the liver. This really is like the most nutrient rich supplements that you can find. And they are amazing. I have tried them. I absolutely love them. So just go to heartandsoil.co, use the coupon code Chantal Ray and save you some money there. Yes. Yeah, so I wanted to tell you that Dr. Gundry really talks mm. about, he says that tomatoes in Italy never come with their skin or their seeds. And when tomatoes were first brought to Italy by Columbus, they refused to eat them for over 200 years because they thought that would be toxic for humans. And then America- they, knew, they knew it was nightshades. Yeah. Yeah. So, they, they knew what nightshades were. Yeah. yeah. And they were thought to be deadly, like in mm. like late- you know, 1800s, but I, he had mentioned something about cashews and he said that cashews are part of the same plant as poison ivy. And he said, it's no wonder that cashews are lectins. 
and because there's poison in their plant main and then that cashews can't be prepared in any way that makes them less toxic to us. And I was thinking, I had this conference that I had to speak at and I was like the main speaker. And I really, it was like the, you know, couple days before I was just trying to eat as clean as I possibly could. I wanted to look good on stage and all of this. And so I wanted a little bit of a snack. I was kind of hungry. And the night before, I had gotten some cashews and I ate a whole bunch of cashews. Mm. I woke up the next day and I I don't eat a ton of cashews, I guess, in general. I woke up the next day. I'm not joking. I felt like a Mack truck had run over me. I felt so bad. I felt so horrible. I was so disappointed because I was like, And I was just like jogging my brain, like, what did I do? Because I literally was, you know, eating so clean and how do I feel so terrible? So, you know, I want you to talk about that of just how bad lectins and nightshades can be for you and why, you know, like, would you ever eat a cashew, I guess? Yeah, no, I, 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 my days of eating cashews are, are long, long gone. And when you think about how hard it is to get into a cashew, it is this big, hard, knobbly nut that you break down and you get this little toenail size, you know, piece of nut out of there. That, that plant is defending that so, so diligently. Um, and, but the, the barrier defense is, you know, oh, once you get through it, then it's fine. No, that's, that's only the beginning of it. There's a lot of toxins in there. So, these lectins are, are a class of plant toxin that actually exists in all plants, and some plants have a lot more of them. And some lectins we know about, like like gluten, we germ and gluten, and that's a lectin. Um, and, uh, and it's a protein. It's a protein with a, with a carbohydrate uh, portion, so it can bind to other carbohydrates, and that's sort of what makes it harmful. Well, that's one of the things that makes it harmful in our body is that it can bind to the carbohydrates on the surface of our cells and interact negatively with them and damage them. Um, animals can make some lectins too. They don't seem to harm us. So there's, there's lectins that do exist in the animal kingdom, but they don't seem to cause any harm. So there are a lot of other very well-known lectins, even though people don't necessarily know that they are lectins, such as ricin. Ricin is a, a toxin, it's a poison. Some people are using it as a, as a means of assassination for a long time. It is the single most deadly substance known to man. One microgram per kilogram of body weight will kill anyone and pretty much any animal. So that is in the, the skin of a, of a castor bean. As we make castor oil, we press these beans and that helps with, with constipation. It works as a laxative and uh, the, the ricin gets left behind, thankfully. And um, that is literally the most deadly thing that we know. That's a lectin. So these lectins are are a complex set of defense chemicals, but they can do a lot of different things in our body. First and foremost, one thing that makes it very topical and relevant to us is that it causes leaky gut or it can cause leaky gut. So like wheat, germ, and gluten, it can bind to the carbohydrate molecules on the surface of our intestinal cells and it damages those tight junctions. And so now you have these just openings in between cells Bacteria can get through, other lectins can get through, oxalates can get through, phytates can get through, saponins can get through, um, you know, everything can get through that we don't want. Normally we have barrier protection. And if we have if we have a healthy gut, then that will just, the, the things will just pass through sort of harmlessly. It's when that, that gut lining gets damaged, then these things can start coming in. Once it's in your body, they can cause a lot of harm. They're associated with quite a lot of different diseases. Autoimmune, we, we discussed already. Lectins seem to be a major driver for autoimmunity because of that fact that they can bind onto the cells and now our body is attacking that complex. But they do more than that. They can actually interfere with our hormones. Some of these lectins can actually mimic insulin and they can bind to insulin receptors five times more tightly than insulin. And so you get this massive insulinogenic effect. So insulin has a lot of roles in your body, over 100 so we think of it as you eat carbohydrates, your insulin goes up, and this keeps your blood sugar down. And it does do that, but it has over 100 different m- mechanisms in your body, and that's just one of them. They have nothing to do with, with uh, glucose management. They have over 100 different things that, that do that, but they do manage glucose. And so when your blood sugar goes up, 
then your total insulin goes up. And actually, this is actually causing a range of effect, negative effects around your body. Lectins do the same thing. They get in your body, even if you're on a ketogenic diet and your blood sugar is nice and low and your insulin is nice and low, these lectins can start binding to those insulin receptors. And insulin is is the, the fat storage hormone. It's the fat storage hormone. Uh, you really can't store fat without insulin. So type 1 diabetics, they don't make any insulin. They cannot store fat. They waste away until they die unless they get insulin. And I actually know type 1 diabetics who, when they just want to cut up and cut down and just lose weight and get chiseled for the summer or for some sort of event, they just stop taking their insulin for a week or so and they just they just um, they just shred fat. Very unhealthy. I don't think anyone should ever do that. That you could you're you're literally risking your life. But I know people that do that. Then you contrast that with people that have an insulin secreting tumor called an insulinoma, and this secretes large volumes of insulin. And these people get extraordinarily obese very quickly. It doesn't matter what they eat. So it's very hormonally driven. And so lectins can mimic that. So even if you're on a ketogenic diet, you have low insulin, these lectins are getting in there. Insulin also interrupts your hormonal uh, hormonal mechanisms with other things like leptin, which is different from lectins, L-E-P-T-I-N. It's a satiety hormone. It's secreted from our fat cells and tells our brain how much energy we have. And so it's like a running gas cage. And when you block that, then your brain doesn't know that we have enough energy. So it says, keep eating, keep eating, keep eating. It also... Um, leptin, leptin also has further knockdown effects on other hormones because it, go, it acts on the level of the hypothalamus, which then affects all the hormones coming out of the pituitary. So you screw with insulin, you're also screwing with leptin, and you're also screwing with all the rest of the, the hormones that come out of your pituitary. Insulin or lectins in women will block the conversion of testosterone into estrogen. Women make testosterone first, and then that's converted into estrogen. And so if you have high lectins or you have high insulin, you will block that conversion and women will get too high of testosterone, too low of estrogen. They can get what's called polycystic ovarian syndrome as a leading cause of PCOS is, uh, is that mechanism. And that's the leading cause of infertility in women. So, you know, the list goes on. I mean, lectins just cause a huge body of harm. There are thousands of these things and they all cause different sorts of harm in the body, but that that's... Uh, sort of a breakdown of uh, some of them anyway, some of the, the high notes. I don't know about you guys, but I am stressed. And if you're feeling overwhelmed this holiday season, then I get it. With all the family get togethers, it is just a relentless source of stress. But anyway, there is something that I've got called Stress Guardian. And it's actually made by Bioptimizers, the people who make the magnesium breakthrough, which I love, love, love. But anyway, they are literally made this new product. It has 14 adaptogenic herbs and it just regulates your stress. I just actually took some right this second. And it's awesome. If you go to stressguardian.com slash waste away and put in waste away for 10% off your first order, it's stressguardian.com slash waste away. Go there now. So let's pretend that you were on vacation with some friends and you were out at a restaurant, you're starving and they're out of meat. <laughs> so name yeah. some things that you would eat. Cause I, cause I really think we need to put this practically for people. And even for me, like I'm not going to eat just meat for the rest of my life. Like I'm not, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, you know. Hey, we have to come up with what are some other things that we can eat that are good for our joints, that we're still feel good. Um, they're not, you know, someone even like me who has autoimmune issues, want to keep them down to at a bay, but also know that I just can't eat meat all day, every day. That's not, a, not reality. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's, it, for me, if I was at, you know, if I was at a restaurant or something like that, and there wasn't anything to eat, I just wouldn't eat. <laughs> um, you know, when you're eating high density nutrition, you don't have to eat as much or as often. And so I, I you know, in neurosurgery, I, I routinely go 36 hours without leaving the hospital and having a chance to eat. And that's fine. Um, I, I think about, oh, steak sounds really good right now. But I think like, okay, I'm, I'm operating all night and I've got all next day in clinic. I'm not going to get home till, you know, 7 p.m. tomorrow night. I'm not going to be able to eat. And my body just goes, that's fine because my brain sees the leptin. And it knows that I'm not starving, so it's not it's not giving me panic signals saying that you have to eat. So I'm fine. 
um, you know, it's it's not it's not abnormal to fast. You know, any any predator in the wild routinely will have to wait several days or a week or more. The Mongolians, like Genghis Khan, the Mongol horde, they routinely would ravage the countryside for five days straight without eating, and then eat ten pounds of horse meat, and then do it again. So this is something we're we're more than uh, capable of dealing with. And so I don't I don't have a problem with that. The only time I'm ever going to eat a plant again is if I'm starving to death and I have to to survive, and that's that's pretty much it. So on some sort of desert island, and I just I have to, and I can't get meat, and I have to sort of I, okay, there's some there's some oranges. All right, I'll eat the damn oranges. You know, if I have to to survive, I will. Otherwise, I'll I'll just fast. But you know, to to answer your question for people that that don't think they can do that, like certainly avoid carbohydrates, grains those sorts of things, I think that, that that's actually a big deal because our primary metabolic state, I believe, is that that ketogenic state. That's the primary metabolic state of basically all animals in the wild, carnivores and herbivores, because 70% of animal species are carnivores. They're just eating meat. They're not eating carbs. And so they're all in that so-called ketogenic state. That's where all of our hemp machinery comes to bear. That's when we start making our energy and we start utilizing our fat stores and we go through autophagy, mitophagy, we're turning over old cells, we're turning over old, old organelles inside of our cells and just keeping everything running very smoothly in sh shape. When you start eating carbohydrates, you derail that. Your insulin goes up and again, there's over a hundred different effects that has in your body and that, that can slow and even stop that autophagy and mitophagy and the normal cellular workings in your body. So I think that that's very important to try to avoid. And so, but certainly, the seeds, right? So seeds, beans, legumes, nuts, grains, all these things are the plant's babies. That's going to be on the hierarchy of things you don't want to eat. I think that's really up there at the top. Did you guys know that your thyroid's main food is iodine? And guess what? Mercury and other toxins gobble up your selenium and your thyroid glands need selenium to convert iodine to thyroxine. So if you have mercury fillings and with all the toxins and mold, your selenium gets, just gets gobbled up. So here's the bottom line. I take something called peak thyroid. It's got iodine, it's got copper, and it's got selenium. Everything you need to get your thyroid back to functioning without medicine. So go to ChantelRayWay.com slash upgraded formulas. Use the coupon code ChantelRay to get a huge discount. So what about what about poultry or seafood or no oh, that's fine or yeah. or um like name some other things that you would have when you just, even yourself where you're like okay I'm not gonna have I'm not gonna have beef you've already said like you'll have eggs mm -hmm. you know name some other things that yeah. you kind of add in any any animals fine so seafood beef chicken fish lamb uh, pork venison moose armadillo, whatever you want to eat. Uh, you know, the thing is, is that like you said, animals can't, or animals can run away or fight back, but plants can't. So they have those, that toxic sort of defense. There are some animals that use poison defense, but they have, you know, their they're poison sac and stingers or certain organs like the, the liver of a polar bear has such a high concentration of vitamin A that it, it will kill you. But apart from that, if what about eating... dairy? Talk about dairy for just a second. Like a lot of people on carnivore will eat goat cheese, hard cheeses, heavy cream, raw milk, um, and just even any kind of cheeses. So are you eating cheese yeah. at all? Uh, I I rarely eat cheese. I, I sort of think of it as a bit of a gray area. It, it, it is animal-based. It has a lot of really good nutrients in it, but some people can, can actually get quite a lot of inflammation from this, uh, generally from the casein, it seems, the, the proteins, in the in the dairy, um, one of them is called casein, and this can be quite pro-inflammatory, and so people can react to that. Especially people with autoimmune issues seem to have more of a problem with the casein. Uh, for butter seems to do pretty well with most people, from what I've seen. But milk, in particular, people can have a problem with, it, especially with autoimmunity or cheeses and things like that. So it's just really it's, if you don't react poorly to it, if you do well with it then great use it as use it as a condiment i wouldn't eat just chunks of cheese though i tell people this and say yeah it's okay but you know eat it with meat meats the meal meat has all the nutrients that you want dairy has a lot of great nutrients in it but it doesn't have everything necessarily you know raw milk is great it has a lot of every of, of things and you could you could do really well 
just on raw milk, but it's it's not as good as a steak. You know, we you know as mammals we drink our mother's milk. Breast milk is is human milk is different than cow's milk. You can't actually give kids the infants cow's milk has too much casein. It's actually bad for them. They can get very sick. Goat's milk is what people used to use in like the 1800s and before if they needed to to give an infant milk and you know they, they didn't have formula but uh, cow's milk they really can't do that until they're a little older so either way you drink milk and then you get weaned off you know all mammals will drink its mother's milk and they get weaned onto the food that their mother's eating and they'll eat that food for the rest of their life they don't go back to milk so while milk is very nutritious and has a lot of really good things that people are have a of a nutrient or diet, or they're in an area and that's the best way they can do it. Great, great idea. Raw milk is wonderful uh, in those circumstances as long as it's not contaminated or anything like that. But it's not as good as a steak. And so what I tell them is use it sparingly and as a condiment. So if you have cheese, you'd melt it onto meat, like a meat patty or something like that. Or maybe you put some uh, you know, plain Greek yogurt with as few carbs as possible onto some ground beef or something like that and mix it together and have that nice sort of combination of flavors. I do find that people can react to this. They can have a bit more inflammation. So they can have more joint pain. They have more autoimmunity, certainly. And they can uh, stall their weight loss. It seems to be something that people stall on their weight loss. Generally, people eat the exact same amount of meat regardless of the amount of dairy they they eat. There is a mild opiate in, in dairy as well. People don't really realize that very mild. I mean, you're not going to get high off this stuff, but but that could give you a bit of a compulsion. Say, well, I want a bit more. I want a bit more. And so you may eat more dairy than you really, your body really needs. And so we we look at the, the different sorts of case here, and this is why they have A1 milk and A2 milk or A1 cheese and A2 cheese. A1 is more inflammatory than A2, but A, A2 is still uh, inflammatory, you know? And so it just depends. So if you don't react, I, I don't react poorly to dairy. Like I can drink milk and be fine. I can certainly use butter and be fine. I actually use a, a lot of butter to increase the fat level. And sort of bouncing back to what you were talking about before in constipation, if you're constipated on a carnivore diet, it means you're not, by definition, you're not eating enough fat because our bodies have a limited capacity to absorb fat with our bile. Our liver makes a certain amount of bile and, and that you have to have bile to emulsify and absorb fat mostly. You can still absorb some without bile, but it's very small amounts. So once you run out of bile, your body really doesn't doesn't absorb fat. It's sort of this this overflow spillover bowel. And you'll absorb a little bit. It was like single digit percentages of the fat that you eat. And so it goes out in your waist. And it's that excess fat that is actually keeping your stool soft. And so you'll absorb about 98% of the meat that you eat as long as you're not eating it with plants, because plants will actually delay and prevent the absorption of a lot of nutrients. Fiber itself can actually prevent up to 30% absorption of nutrients in your body, which is why they say, well, this helps with blood sugar control when you're eating a you know, carby diet. And like, well, no wonder it's blocking 30% of the absorption of those carbs in your body. Of course, it's going to reduce your blood sugar. Um, and that's fine. If you're eating a horrible processed food diet with a bunch of garbage or a lot of sugar, this is what, why they say that the fructose, which is sugar in fruit isn't that big of a deal because there's fiber in there and that will delay the absorption or prevent the uh, a certain percentage of absorption and that's true but you're still getting some you know so it's not perfect but uh it does delay that but if you're only eating meat you want to absorb that you want to absorb all that you actually don't want to prevent your absorption so if you're only eating meat you're not eating fiber you're not eating anything else you'll absorb 98 percent of the meat that you're eating if you cut out the gristle it'll be nearly 100 percent and that's what Dr. Salisbury did in the 1800s. He removed the the gristle. That was what a Salisbury steak was. That's where that 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 food comes from. That was from Dr. Salisbury. Uh, that wasn't from Salisbury, England, or anything like that. And it was a special way of grinding hamburger that filtered out the gristle. So you only had the soft meat and the soft fat. And people would absorb basically 100 percent of that. And that was he said that was really important for people with these bowel issues like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Because they, they, I mean, again, there's a hundred years before we had any effective treatment for these sorts of things pharmacologically. And so these people were in horrible pain. They had 30 bouts of bloody diarrhea day in and day out. And the only thing that basically helped is they just stopped eating. They fasted. So again, they're eliminating out the things that they're eating. They were causing this um, problem with their gut. 
And so he said, you have to just completely rest the bowel. You just can't have anything going through that. And that's how you do that. You get rid of the gristle and just the soft meat and the soft fat, and you absorb absolutely everything. So if you get constipated, as in you have dry, hard, difficult to pass stools, not infrequent stools, that's not constipation. Constipation is the consistency of the stools, not the frequency. But if you're having hard, dry stools, by definition, you're not eating enough fat. And in fact, there was a randomized controlled trial in people that had symptomatic constipation. So it's a human trial. And they broke them up into four categories. One, they just kept them the same, eat the same way, same amount of fiber. One, they increased the fiber. One, they reduced the fiber. And one, they eliminated fiber completely. And it stratified out exactly the opposite of, as what you would expect from what we've been told. People that stayed eating the same way stayed the same. People that increased fiber actually got worse. People that reduced fiber got better. And then people who completely eliminated fiber, they all completely resolved their symptoms, 100% of them. So it's it's not necessarily what we've been told. We've been told that we need fiber for peristalsis to move this through. That was that was a fiction sold to us. We were told that this helps with bowel cancer because someone named Dr. Burkett, who was a very famous doctor uh, for whom uh, Burkitt's lymphoma is named after, um, he was on a on a you know medical mission in Africa, and he noticed that people were having very large bowel motions. They thought it was because they were eating these these big fibrous plants. And he noticed that this population also had low rates of bowel cancer. So he just said, oh, must be from the fiber. Fiber must prevent bowel cancer. That's all that came. That's all it was. There was no experiment. There was no data. There was no intervention. It was just he looked at this and said, I bet you that's what that is. And because he was very famous and he had a lot of clout, people just picked it up and they just started repeating it and repeating it. And now it's in textbooks. And and you'd be surprised how much in medicine it originated exactly like that. So when when you look at this again i mean 70 percent of animal species are carnivores they all defecate very easily um you know to your to your what you were saying before you don't know any carnivores that say i have perfect bowel motions i have perfect bowel motions they are just they're soft tiny, we'll have like to have you the picture we'll have some <laughs> picture. It, it's going to be a while because it's, it's maybe once or twice a week and it's this tiny volume. It's like little cat turds, you know? It's just, it's, there's nothing there. I'm absorbing nearly all of this. But when it comes out, it's it's So, you're saying, so you're saying that right now, you're only going to the bathroom once or twice a week. Yeah, because there's no waste there. There's nothing there to go, right? Because I'm absorbing all of it. So when it comes out, though, it's, it's just small volume. It's very soft. You know, I have no bloating. I have no, I mean, I have no, uh, you know, flashlands to speak of. I mean, that, that's just gone. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and when, it, when there's something there, it comes out, but there's, I mean, it's just that much. It's tiny. Some people will still go every day, but if it's hard, it means that you're not eating enough fat. Awesome. Well, we are out of time. This has been amazing. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, well, my, my main channels, my YouTube channel is just Anthony Chafee MD. And I have quite a lot of uh, videos there that people can, can look at if they, there's hundreds there. So if you don't want to work your way through those, uh, just go to a playlist called, uh, getting started on a carnivore diet and sort of a curated list of some of the, some of the key points. And then I have, uh, my Instagram account is just again, Anthony Chafee MD. And I have other things like Twitter, Anthony underscore Chafee, but you can find my other stuff through, through my other channels, but those are the main ones. And then my podcast is called The Plant Free MD for obvious reasons. Awesome. Well, you guys stay tuned. We've got another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>